I'm ready. It's a delicate okay. subject because Latin America is known for its modernism, right? Correct. And uh, and the Latin American modern that book is wonderful. It's the classical modernism that you know with a social cause actually, which is nice. Uh, but it still is old school modernism. Right. So one has to be aware, uh, beware of that. I believe actually that Bruce Goff was much more uh, avant-garde than any of those modernistic uh, examples of Latin America. So, yeah. I mean, the, so tonight I'll just begin just showing you Alejandro Pietri and then we'll roll into the lecture. Sounds good. And just to let you know, the last, last week we, we uh, talked about Havana. So uh, just, you know, just kind of a... Sure. I did, um, I've do, I did a project for Havana for the old port of Havana. We looked into how it could be revitalized. Yeah. We, I'm not going to show that today, of course. Let's do it. Right. Excellent. Yeah. So, so let me see if I can share screen, right? You should be able to, yes. Okay. You guys want me to start? We'll do it. Yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, it should work. All right. How does it look now? Perfect. Looks good. Yes. Okay. Here we go. Oh, so, wait, wait. Uh, um, I'm sorry. I'm going to have Emma present you. Oh, of course. <laughs> I almost Hi, forgot Alfredo. Hi, how's it going, Emma? Good. So we're so glad that you are coming to speak to us today, and we can't hear about, wait to hear about Caracas. And I'm going to read a little bit about you for everybody. Um, Alfredo Br Brillenborg was born in New York. He received his Bachelor of Art in Architecture in 1984 and his Master of Science in Architectural Design in 1986 from Columbia University. In 1992, he received a second architecture degree from the Central University of Venezuela and began his independent architecture practice. In 1998, he and Hubert Klumpner found Urban Think Tank, UTT, in Caracas, Venezuela. Since 1994, he has been a member of the Venezuelan Architects and Engineers Association and has been a great professor at the University Jose Mar Maria Vargas, the University of Sim Simon Bolivar, and the Central University of Venezuela. Starting in 2007, Brillenborg has been a guest professor at the Graduate School of Architecture and Planning, Columbia University, where he co-founded the Sustainable Living Urban Model uh, Laboratory, also known as Slum Lab. Um, sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> From 2010 to 2019, Brillenborg and Klumpner co-held the Chair for Architecture and Urban Design at the Swiss Institute of, Ar of Technology, ETH, in Zurich, Switzerland. From 2019, Klumpner is solely responsible for the chair. As co-principal of UTT, Brillenborg has received the 2010 Ralph Erskine, Erskine Award, the 2011 Wholesome Gold Award for Latin America, the 2012 Wholesome Gold Silver Award for Innovative Contributions to Ecological and Social Design Practices, and the 2012 Venice Biennial of Architecture Golden Line. Thank you, uh, Alfredo, and we can't wait to hear more. Sure, sure, of course. Um, here we go. Let's start the lecture. It's Caracas. Uh, Caracas is quite nice, uh, a word, because it has three A's for architecture, right? Um, Caracas. It is the place, um, if I were to describe myself, I would say my heart is in Caracas, my brain is in New York City, and my bank account is in Switzerland. Yeah, that's a joke, right? <laughs> because we don't make any money anyway. But we did go to Switzerland with the idea of transferring money from good-hearted Swiss and Scandinavians to South America for our projects. Um, we've been somewhat successful, but not as successful as we thought. So a long time ago, 1992, I began a book on Alejandro Pietri, very interesting architect, Venezuelan, to the bone. But... He was a bad boy. As all bad boys, one anecdote was when he got married, he built himself his own house and he lived next to his father-in-law who had given him a piece of property. 
and his father-in-law was tired of seeing him kind of a 60s child um, bathing naked in the garden as he, a very conservative father-in-law that he had, uh, Mr. Wallace. And Mr. Wallace said, you cover up. I don't want to see you anymore. And, uh, and so one day, Alejandro uh, went over to dinner to his house invited, and he came naked. And of course, he was thrown out of the house the whole time. A couple of months went by and he started to be a nice guy. And he invited Mr. Wallace, his father-in-law, over to his house. He opened the door and he was naked, of course. And he said, in my house, I do the, what I want. So that was the character of this individual in the middle of his house. It's quite extraordinary. Um, it, it was, uh, he had a jacuzzi. And then out from that central jacuzzi, like a flower with its different pods and petals, he had the different rooms and bedrooms all going out with beams in a radial flower form. Um, all of this was based on Bruce Goff, as you guys know, um, his, the famous house that's the Bavinger house that swirls and things like that. So, this is the man we're talking about, Alejandro Pietri. He was from a Venezuelan family. He was naughty. So his parents sent him first to study in Oklahoma oil, right? Because Oklahoma is known for oil, a great um, um, uh, school on petroleum. And, and, um, and of course, he didn't like it at all. And he switched to architecture. And when he switched to architecture, he ran into Bruce Goff, which is amazing. Now, this is a historic photograph where you see on the left, one of our great architects, Jimmy Alcock, then Alejandro Pietri, who came from a Corsican family, Venezuelan, but Corsican family with a little bigo, be, you know, uh, uh, goatee or, no, or, or actually little mustache. And then right in the middle is Carlos Raul Villanueva. He's the equivalent of our Niemeyer. He actually learned a lot from the Corbusier uh, in Paris and, and he was our great uh, architect of the Central University. And then you have anyone recognized all the way to the right, that's Bourle Marx, the great landscape architect, Roberto Bourle Marx, who did the parks. And Alejandro was instrumental in designing the zoo in that park. Now, the interesting thing was of course, he studied under Bruce Goff, who had studied under Frank Lloyd Wright, and he came back to Venezuela very much a very changed person. He believed in all of these incredible uh, ideas that Bruce Goff, let me see if I can zoom in. No, no I can't zoom in, sorry. Um, uh, you will see, one of his projects, for instance, for the Venezuelan pavilion um, in, in uh, Republica Dominicana, Dominican Republic, it's very interesting because it has this very interesting tropical concrete structure like a ziggurat, right? Or you see here a residential facade that is completely closed with a, with a kind of Moroccan thing. Or on the right, the cable car of Caracas. He designed these kind of turtle, turtle, turtle shell cable car structures um, that became very well known as the roofs of the cable car. Now, this is an interesting man who was folding paper or a gum. There were no architects like him. That's all coming from Oklahoma, just to let you know. And then here you see that pavilion from Dominican Republic that's like a snake, right? That, you know, wavers to the left and quite interesting. Or this apartment building where every apartment is on a different level. So the, whole, the section of the building is fascinating. As you can see, no window matches up with another window. I mean, it's, he was really, really an innovative architect. I just say that as a little connection to your school, Oklahoma. Now, all of you know probably that I wrote the book called Informal City Caracas Case. Caracas is an informal city. 60% um, of, oh, let me just put this on. Can you hear? Can you hear?
There's scenes in informal city all around the city. This is the largest slum in the world. <laughs> so I take that off now because you've seen a bit of Caracas, you've seen the density of it. Um, it's a six million city. It is 60% informal. Why? Because we're an oil economy. Venezuela was had soaring rocket price oils in the 70s, 80s, 90s. And migration from all over Latin America came to the capital city, Caracas, of course. So I'm going to talk about oil in the automobile city. I'll talk about the hybrid city. And then I'll talk about multiple hubs. So of course, Robert and I were trained in the classical fashion. We went to Columbia University. We were trained in parametric design. We could to design, you know, all kinds of cool facades, Frank Gehry style, whatever. All of that was not possible when we got to Venezuela. The reality was different. We had to confront a completely different situation and system. Um, but here is a little uh, image of Humboldt. Baron von Humboldt, who wrote The Cosmos, probably one of the most important books of the 19th century, all about his trips to Venezuela, Colombia, and other Latin American countries. So the Latin American, because this is the Latin American lecture series, the Latin American was known as the sleepy Mexican. Rene, forgive me for, for that, we, with the big sombrero. You know, you guys know that from, from TV shows, you know, Speedy Gonzalez, right? But then later in Botero, right, it became known as the Mafia. You know, uh, you know, the Latino became the Scarface, right? All of you have seen that movie, Al Pacino and Scarface, you know, do you trust him? So the Latino image went from sleepy, you know, kind of good natures rural to becoming the most feared gangsters in the world. El Chapo was just on TV the other day, right? You guys know, because his girlfriend was just captured. And Hubert and I kind of feel that we become a hybrid, kind of a lucha libre Mexican wrestler with a Swiss flag, right? Just to give you that idea, why? Because I want you guys to understand that we had to I, we had to play into different cultures. It's about hybridity. And Latin American teaches, teaches you about hybridity because there's been so much migration. You know, um, Octavio Paz, the great, the great thinker of Mexico, he wrote um, that Latin Americans are the cosmic society because they are from all the planet. You know, the Latin American is the mixture of all races. And that's kind of beautiful to think of about Latin America, right? Um, and, and also Latin America is probably one of the most urbanized planets in the world. Just someone answer this question. What do you guys think on average is the amount of people living in cities in Latin America? Someone just tell me. You know, you've heard that we have reached now 50% of, 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 of the population is living in cities, right? That was a big revelation. What do you think Latin America is? Eighty five percent Yeah, 80%. Caracas is 89% urban. So what's that telling you? Latin America is leading the world in what happens when you get super dense, right? If not, Rene can tell you about Tijuana. So the World Bank 
has all these great projects, right? IDB, Inter-American Development Bank, whatever. They've got all these wonderful projects to connect rivers, to make super highways, um, to do, you know, uh, trains crossing the whole thing to urbanize even more Latin America. Let's cut up the whole Amazon basin, right? You've read Ana Maria Duran. She writes about that, you know, and it's a bit crazy, right? And here we are flying over those basins. You see incredible nature. Now, when Le Corbusier flied over this area, you know that he went to Latin America in a Zeppelin. Does everyone know that? The great trip that Corbu did in 1930-something was to go to Latin America and where he, for the first, he was going to Argentina, by the way, in, for the first time in his life, he saw the scale of things. If you, if you understand, you fly over Brazil where he also went, you, you see rivers that you've never seen before because, you know, the scale of these, these pampas and stuff um, and untouched nature. So this is what he saw. And this is where he came up with the law of meandering. Does anyone know, have you, you heard about Corbu's law of meandering? You see that river that meanders there in the distance, right? back and forth, he started to realize that it was so interesting that rivers overflow and they change shape. They need area next to the river. If not, Rene can tell you about the Tijuana River, right? You know, crossing the border. But it, it, it needs area and space around it. So he also, he came up with this idea of the law of meandering, which was that architecture, also needed, needed this kind of green space all around, you know, and it needed to be big and it needed to be large. So what did he do? He made the famous building for Rio de Janeiro that was a big snake, one continuous building all along the coast of Rio, which was like the river, but in a building, right? all surrounded by green. But as you fly closer to Buenos Aires, you start to see the grid, you start to see the urbanization, you start to see the makeshift urbanism, right? This is all informal. This, is, this has no, no regulations, no plans, right? And suddenly we arrive into the city. And what you see in Venezuela is the coexistence of two cities, a golf course, a luxury golf course, and then a favela or a barrio right next door. And what did we get? We got Chavez. We got socialism. We've been 20 years with a dictator. I mean, Chavez died, but he passed on the mandate to Maduro, who's the next. So I left Venezuela because it was no longer possible to work in a dictatorship. So, so let's begin by saying that we're living in a time of crisis. Crisis runs parallel to the crisis of art, culture, collective consciousness. This is what I had to confront as an architect. And you all have to confront your time in your place where you want to practice architecture. You need to confront your reality. For me, my reality was a skyscraper in the middle of Caracas, wanting to be the third largest skyscraper of Latin America, squatted. 25 floors because the, the builder went bankrupt, the state overtook the building, he died, and then they left the building 17 years unfinished and it got squatted completely. So our desire is to transform cynicism, nihilism of this squatted building in downtown Caracas into an architecture of thinking about a new way to think about economic recession and radical politics because socialism doesn't have an answer. It didn't have an answer in the Soviet Union either. They, they did these, these modernistic blocks, you know, you know, Stalin Alley in Berlin, you can see it also, um, is ridiculous. So they don't really understand participation in architecture. But this tower did 
it was quite interesting. I'm not condoning squatting. I'm just saying the phenomena of what happened. People organized themselves to build apartments, to, to, to divide up the building and to work collectively, put in water, sewage, everything without the help of government. That was fascinating. Here you see some images of that, right? little stores on floors. It's a city within a city, a uh, gymnasium on the 22nd floor, you know, and um, that was just the introduction into all of this. So think about a city where gasoline is cheaper than water, drinking water. Think about a city which has gas stations like Texaco, where it's the only safe place to be because they protect the oil, right? And the gasoline. So everyone hangs around there at night, you know, in the shopping uh, store and, you know, with their motorcycles and whatever. Think about a city that sprawls over hills, valleys, and uh, it's all about um, this informality, right? It didn't begin that way. It began in the 17th century, like a grid, like all Latin American cities, the Spanish cities, they began like a grid, right? And then that grid slowly went conquering the valley because Caracas is built 1000 meters up off of sea level, right? And that grid was extended outward into the valley, right? quite beautiful photograph where you see this, the Plaza Bolivar, the central square, and, and, and then the grid. Now, if you look at this map carefully, you'll see that there's little archipelagos of urbanization that appear all down the central river, El Guaire River. You see how they kind of plug in to kind of like a string of pearls? What that is, is private developers who owned farms who decided one to develop it in an American way with curves. Another one did a grid more French. Another one did a combination and none of those grids connect. So you can imagine the traffic. So the only road that you can get on by is that central road to right down covering the riverbed, right? Right down to the center of the city. So here you see the disconnection, disconnection of topography, of neighborhoods that don't connect, roads that are just don't connect, right? But as the oil boom came in, 1970, Venezuela is the number one oil producer in the world. Why? Because during World War II, Venezuela supplied America, U.S., with the oil. Um, in fact, on Occidental Petroleum, which I believe is in Oklahoma, or maybe it has a has some kind of uh, a relationship to your university, Occidental. They were one of the big um, guys who were helping Venezuelan oil export. So we got modernization, we got fast cars, we got big highways, and this beautiful red roof city of the colonial city was destroyed for this for American modern high rise with maybe a little French touch of an Eiffel Tower there in the middle, right? Like an obelisk, right? Here you see it. And this is how Caracas began to urbanize. But that didn't last for eternity. In 1998, there was a revolution. The revolution was a military lieutenant called uh, Chavez, Hugo Frias Chavez, who, who who actually convinced the public that he had a better plan for Venezuela, that it was unequal, that there was too much inequality. So we went from these huge highways, right, who were benefiting, of course, the builders, the infrastructures, the politicians, the families at the time, and the government, of course, could own, own the oil, to a situation of a hyper-dense city and, and, and the grid extending, and here you see a little video. Maybe you guys can see it expanding. You have the years of the Republic in the 19th century. You have the national development, early 20th. And then here you have the oil economy boom. You see the scale, the jump in scale. Caracas was a small town of a million. Um, and here you see the numbers increasing. And what you see in yellow now are the slums growing 
in Caracas. We were the first ones to map out this. So we became known for a spokesman for using maybe that political moment of, of change to try to convince the government to do infrastructure development in the slums. We had people like Edwin Moses, uh, the famous guy who did the highways in New York City, um, Robert Moses, sorry, who, who came to Caracas to make highways for us. Here you see him. But obviously mobility was completely locked. Cars became a nightmare, traffic for hours, right? So you can do your whole uh, shopping for the evening on the street. People come to you in the traffic jams. Then underneath these highways are incredible underground cities, right? These are the under the, the posts of the columns of the highway, elevated highway. People have, have uh, even put their, their, their direct TV, right? Their, their satellite TVs, right? And we became a very American economy. And that's what Chavez fought against, right? So my generation found itself with a, this hybrid city. We had super modernism. And then we also um, had incredible informality. So that's why I, I stick here a little link to urban thinking because everything that you're gonna see from here on has something to do with what we did. So I began as a typical modernist architect. This is where the think tank began. This was the office and the house where we lived. Not very big, very thin, but very tall, three floors. I lived on top of the office. We made projects like this, residential apartments, duplex, very inspired by the architecture of the time, the 80s, 90s, Aldo Rossi, et cetera. We also were inspired by, you know, a little bit of Khan and Alvarado. So we were producing sort of run-of-the-mill modernism. But all of that changed when the revolution came. We realized, how can architects respond to this crisis? This is an exhibition of ours in Zurich, where we um, made a kind of exhibition, travel exhibition using uh, plastic waste water pipes and then using fabric so that it could be assembled and disassembled and taken to different parts in the world without any waste uh, whatsoever, right? And then now I've just written this book called The Architect in the City, Ideology, Idealism and Pragmatism. It'll be out in about a month or two, actually I would say two months in Hanja Khan's. Here you see the book, 600 pages that tells you our whole history of the last 200, uh, 20 years, 200 years, 20 years. And it will tell you all of our failures also, right? So 60% of the people of Caracas live in barrios. When we came to Caracas, well, this is a neighborhood where the largest slum is located. But behind the mayor's uh, seats, was this map and it said Zona Verdes. The resolution is not very good, but means green zone. These two white spots on the map means green zone. But actually we said, are you crazy? One million people live on these areas. So we mapped it out and we made the true map. But if the mayor were to include all these people on his map, he would give acknowledgement that they exist. These are informal dwellers who don't pay taxes. So they are still not mapped on the, map, on the official maps or cards. And here you see one of the Barrios Cotas 905, where we worked, where you see the gunshots at night. And during the day, the kids play on the only available open space. So we were risking our lives till we couldn't risk it anymore. We made these posters, put them all around in the Venice Biennale. What you call a barrio, I call my home. You know, we were trying to raise consciousness that on this hillside, right in front of the formal city, is actually a kind of ancient and modern community. It has the typology of an Italian hilltown, but it has the materials of a modern city. 
And this guy is what we call a pirate urbanist called Horacio Enaro, 89 years old when we met him and researched him. He was the pioneer who would cut hills with his brother for people to live in in Pitare, in that big hill I just showed you. So this is an animation very early on in the 90s we did, where you do the shack, they cut the hill, they put maybe an outdoor toilet or something, and then they build columns, they build around it, and then they build new structures, and they expand upwards, and they rent the ground floor, and then on the Last floor, they had, you know, grow uh, some kind of herbs and, and, and agroponics, right? And um, this is a letter that we, correspondence we had with, with Yona Friedman, where we were trying to design a skyscraper that would be kind of a plug-in system for kind of these houses, right? So, so how could we do it vertically? How could people build their apartments in a vertical format? You see the plan and then you see the two elevations there. This is the kind of scheme we came up with, a concrete structure that people could build out over time. I mean, Rene probably knows our work. Some of you will know her. If you buy the book Torre David, Tower of David, you will see some of these images. But Oscar Genaro first cuts the hill right? He's, a, he's the headman. He banks it. He prepares it. He's a, he's a kind of developer. He's got lots. He develops for other people. And then a hill that looks like this slowly turns into this over 20 years. It's quite fascinating. Then they connect up to the electrical grid. Then the state comes in and says, shit, there's a lot of people there living. We have to do roads and infrastructure. So they come in after the fact and put the infrastructure in. Right? They need to win votes. So people begin their houses with a five square meters per person in a three family home. And they end up with 15 square meters per person over 20 years right? They expand the house and they also get a number of more of children. And here we were, you know, doing um, all kinds of research on different homes, right? You can see it here, right? The surface per person ends up in 16 square meters and there's eight people living in the home, but it began with five square meters. So, you have all kinds of ideas for definition of informal economy from Saskia Sassen, but you, you have Henri Lefebvre, who's very important to us, who said stability becomes both active and formal and the prototype and model for the real. In this way, a certain elasticity or plasticity of structures, their inner contradiction, and profound action of negation of time are marginalized. The formal have permanent structures, which succeed after a time. And the gaps in classification between formal and informal are highly revealing. And um, so we started to go into this topic because when we flew a helicopter, we realized that all of these valleys were covered with houses we had never seen. So we declared one area called 23rd of January, where a famous architect had done Corbusian blocks, 25 Corbusian blocks, 23 de Enero. We declared it uh, an anti-monument uh, uh, of humanity because it began as this and everyone loved it. And if you talk to any Venezuelan, they'll say, oh yeah, Villanueva's blocks were incredible. But I'm more fascinated when it became hybrid when a whole informal city set in between the blocks. So the village came in the city, right? In between the blocks, became the glue that cemented the blocks together. What does that mean? The baker, the tailor, that all the services that were missing from the modern city came in. All the scale, the cooks, the restaurants, the services, the people, the workers came in between the buildings. And I'm interested in this hybridity of situation. Here you see it um, just clean, and here you see it with the hybrid city. It's much more interesting, yet most of my colleagues would negate that affirmation. But I'm fascinated by this image. 
And that drove me. Here you see the two lonely blocks in the sea of informality, right? So now we move on to multiple hubs. So our country, ours is, or our city is ungovernable with six different mayors, six different police forces, six different uniforms. This is by the way, characteristic of most Latin American cities, most African cities, most South Asian cities. So don't be surprised, right? So this, you might as well learn about this. This is Caracas and 23 de Enero, the neighborhood that I wanna show you now is up there on the right, the top left. But we started to think, can we think of transportation systems that are not linear, but like not, and, and can be flexible, right? You have the hub and spoke, which is very linear. A mesh network's interesting, but can we do a deformed network that can really help initiate different ideas and, and, and satellite cities connected, et cetera, right? So we started to look at these kind of buildings that are right in the heart of the informal zone. We said, these have to be community centers, hubs, major hubs, right? To give glue or to give importance to it all, right? So this is the subway. And wherever the, and they were building the subway at the time. And we wanted to plug in a new transportation system to the subway system, right? Um, so we invented, maybe you guys can see, there's a little U-shaped thin line up there right in the middle. And that is the official line of the cable car network that we are the first ones to implement a mobility urban cable car. Of course, we invented it, but we were not the first ones to finish it. Colombia, Medellin did the first one as a straight line. Ours is a loop of 2.5 kilometers right here. You'll see it. We, we took this hill as an example, and we used these water tanks that were no longer being used on the top of the hill to become the stations because people had to walk up on average 45 floors to get to their home, right? And they'd push up the food up these hills, right? As you, or bring them down because there was one access road. So here's a Team 10 image by Jack Bakema. Bakema, a fantastic Dutch architect, part of Team 10. And he talks about the 1940 city, which is kind of infra public infrastructure, train network is separate from the housing. And then you get the, early 20th century, where the train and the elevator starts to connect the mobility systems. And then you get the, you know, what could be the 21st century, that could be this mixture between private and public mobility. So the government wanted to open roads like you see on the left, but we made maps with those little red dots that showed the government that if they opened those roads, they'd knock down all of these houses that had just built new floors and had in invested capital. So we called for committees, we organized these committees, and we said we could use these tanks that were empty on the top to be cable car stations. And we built the cable car stations that you can see here. We brought in Austrian technology, and we bridged with Austria, the embassy, and we were able to move from the government. So it goes from these monumental slabs, you can fly up over the city. As you see here in the distance, maybe you can see the cable car stations on the top three of them. And you can fly from one cable car station to the other. Here you see the yellow dots, maybe. We, how did we get that done? We had to make a book presented to the Austrian ambassador who does Chamber of Commerce with Austria and Venezuela and got it to the president. We couldn't get it to the socialist dictator, right? And we of course painted it red. And, and, uh, and we were able to get that thing passed. So you have to transgress your own boundaries sometimes, your own limits, your own boundaries of territory to get things built and get money for it. So here's our plan. You can see the cable car stations looping. Here you see our first image was on the Harvard Design Magazine cover. This was done in half an hour. It's a collage. 
that we put together, right? Here are the real cable car stations with ramps that, that bring you up the hill or down the hill, right? And then we plugged in vertical gymnasiums, music schools, theaters that only partially got built. Here you can see the station above with, with the social infrastructure. So this became much more than just a mobility system, right? Here you see it plugging into the whole metro of the city. And if you can fly right out of the metro station up the hill. Um, here's our drawing as a complete loop with bus lanes and tracks, dedicated bus lines. So we made a circular mobility. That's what's so key about this lesson, right? We had to invent stations. No one knew how to make stations up on the hills, on the rooftop with no elevators. We wanted no elevators. And these are the music schools that we proposed to plug into the stations and then replace them in apartment buildings for additional social housing that each floor had community spaces that were shared spaces, you know, shared living. Of course, you guys all know about that, right? And here you see the vertical gyms plugged into the stations. Here you see the steel structure of the vertical gyms plugging into the stations under construction. And the vertical gyms are this typology of a flexible unit, steel unit that can be, that can change, that can, you know, every facade can be customized. Basically, the architecture's in the structure. We build it into the structure because we can't control the architecture, the aesthetics afterwards. After a certain moment, they say, you know, you can't be determining the materials. So you have to let go, but your architecture has to be strong enough in the structure to withstand any transgression to your architecture. Here you see the cable cars from above, and here you see them functioning. I don't know, maybe you guys can see that. Yeah. And the stations are illuminated there down in the corner in, in green at night. There you, there you can see them. And it moves. 1,500 people per hour in the informal city. Oh, there we go. And what was the worst part of the city, in my point of view, became the most interesting part of the city by just this reversal of perspective. To fly over an urban city like that with a cable car is really fascinating. You would be fascinated to do that. So what do we do? You guys as a generation, if you're confronted with revolution, with, with crisis, one out of every five Europeans today is poor. What are you gonna do? How are you gonna to respond to your generation? Or we make architecture, social architecture, or we will have more revolution, do not doubt that. And I am for democracy, but you have to build democracy with architecture. This is Caracas just a few months ago. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Wow. Thank you, Alfredo. That was uh, really intensive and great. Um, I want to... I want to open it to the students. I, I, I hope they have a lot of questions because there's a lot of content in, uh, that you gave. So uh, we'll open a and a Q &A session. So I think Emma should begin since she's your host. So Emma, do you have any questions for uh, Alfredo? Hi, yes. I was so inspired. Honestly, I think this is one of the most inspiring, um, like, presentations I've listened to in my college career of hearing many different people but um I thought it was very cool how um <clears throat> you drew from Bruce Goff and I can see it in your work of how like you actually wanted to confront like real problems and use resources and stuff but um I have many questions but I'll say uh, the first one is how did Bruce Goff personally influence you right um yeah 
So Bru what, is, what did Bruce confuse? He used the most readily available material. Do you know that he used uh, uh, stuff from the military, right? You know, shells, things, uh, anything, right? He, and he experimented. He wasn't scared to experiment. And he was free. He was free with his ideas. We couldn't have thought of a cable car system if we hadn't had broken out of our modernistic thinking. That is so cool. Another question to add on to that is, um, was it mostly political why you had to um, present the book to the Austrian government so they could go to the Venezuelan yeah. government? I come from the status quo of Venezuela, families, right? So they weren't going to let me into the, into the socialist revolution. So we had to bifurcate to, get, to, to come into that. And I didn't mind who paid for it because I knew it was good. I knew it would remain despite generations of dictatorships. That is so cool how just much of a leader you are. I'm, I'm very inspired by you. Well, I don't know. Some people would question that. <laughs> <laughs> I do try. I'm, I'm strong, yes. I Strong-willed. But... Um, yeah, I wish I had been able to build more. Right. Anybody, anybody else? A question for Alfredo from our class. Please. We're doing good on time. Don't be shy. I have another one if no one else wants to go. <laughs> go for it. So um, it was about the the vertical, I guess, apartments you would say um, you designed for the slums, Do how many of those have been built or was it just conceptual that they could grow? We actually built one, I didn't show it, but we built a small prototype of that flexible housing. And where did we do it? Who was our client? The Anglican Church. And, we, and they had a parish house. But after the floods in 1999, came some terrible floods in Venezuela with 200,000 people displaced on the coast. And the Anglican Church wanted to respond, but didn't have any land. So we said, well, we could build one of these concrete structures over your parish house. And we did. And then it grew over time. And it was finished out over time. But it was just a prototype. You'll see it in my new book coming up. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Questions? And this isn't a question, but can you talk a little bit more about your book that you're discuss? Yeah, so, uh, so we've been affected quite a bit about ideology, right? Um, I've been plagued with ideology, whether it's, you know, it's right wing, left wing, and you have to take sides. And if you don't take sides, politicians don't give you the work. And, um, and we were always trying to avoid ideology, right? I have ideology. I know what I believe in. I believe in certain truisms or moralities and certain things, right? But, uh, but I don't believe in parties. I don't, I don't take part, uh, uh, I don't ass aside by, by, a, by a party. I want all the parties to work together because the city is one. It's everyone's. So everyone should, so I proposed a bridge between two municipalities that had two different mayors. And I tried to get the two mayors to, to, to come together and build the bridge between their two respective municipalities and they wouldn't do it. So for me, that's why the book has a subtitle, Architect and the City. Do you guys know that, that the greatest, one of the five greatest books in the 20th century probably is The Architecture of the City? Have you guys heard of that title? The Architecture of the City? No? It's by Aldo Rossi. It's Rossi wrote that in 1966, The Architecture of the City, where he analyzed the architecture of the European city primarily, right? But, 
And he concluded at the end that the European city needed a new kind of architect. So I wrote a sequel to that book, which is called The Architect, not The Architecture, The Architect in the City, which is the architect now needs to be placed at the center of responsibility. And he is responsible for making the city. And we've lost that responsibility. We've lost because we, we sold ourselves to developers. So I talk in the book about ideology. I talk about idealism, which is your ideals. What are you trying to achieve? What are you building architecture for, right? What are you studying it for? And then finally, pragmatism. In the end, you have to be pragmatic. You have to be strategic. You have to take your decisions to get something done that does some impact. That's so there you go. That's the answer. Excellent. Anybody else? Have great questions. Uh, Brock, Coralie. Jacob. Uh, yeah, I actually do have a uh, question. Um, I can see the question in your face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm uh, I'm just blown away by. Ooh. Yeah. Sorry. Um, very innovative ideas. Um, I had a question about the uh, the cable car. Um, so you said that um, Austria um, funded it. Um, does do they maintain it as well, like to this day? No, no. It's paid for by Venezuela. What I said- It's paid for by Venezuela. Yeah. What I said was they bought, the, they bought the equipment from Austria, but Austria did the lobbying. So because Austria was interested in selling the equipment, they invested the money that we were able to do the design. So it wasn't coming okay. from Venezuela. Okay. How big are the uh, water tanks that you have the hubs for the cable car in? Are oh, they pretty the cramped dimension, spaces? Dimension of those water tanks. Oh, that the dimension of those water tanks, they must be like 30 meters in diameter. 90 feet. Yeah. 30, maybe 40 meters diameter. Pretty big. Mm -hmm. Great. I have one more question. Um, you talked about how Medellin also built um, a similar structure. Have you seen like more of a spread in Latin America of yeah, implementing Bolivia, that? Bolivia, which had a kind of revolutionary government at that time, Bolivian president, he's no longer in power anymore. But um, the Chavez helped him out during his presidency. Um, and he, Chavez gave him the whole cable car idea and uh, Doppelmayr, the same company, the Austrian company went down there and they have developed a huge cable car network in, in La Paz in Bolivia. And Brazil also did it with Jorge Mario Jauregui, a Brazilian architect. They did a cable car network, but it was failed because they did no community participatory process. Whereas we did, we, we were in those hills, um, they didn't. So in Brazil, it's been quite rejected. They also did one in uh, Mexico City, uh, you know, a few years ago. Uh, so yeah, the, it's been catching on. Even in uh, Tijuana, they're thinking of putting one. Uh, so yeah, that's, that idea has been uh, evolving over, over time, but uh, you guys were the, the first one to put it up there on the in the world stage. Yes. Any any other questions for Alfredo? Yeah. Um, when you were researching how to come up with the cable car solution, did you and like you obviously said you worked a lot with the community. Did you ever like immerse yourself in the community and living how uh, they live to see how you would be affected by it? Yeah. Um, 
So the communities were amazing, and I spent lots of time up there. And we had we have we had an extended family of office uh, advisors who came from the community, who came down to our office, and we went up there with him. But you can't walk around in the community, uh, being from my kind of status from the city, even though rich or not rich, but they know you're you're like you're you're well off, right? You have better you have a car, you have this and that. So it's incredibly violent there. You can't, you, you can't stay there. We stayed there one night and there were gunshots going off all the time. Yeah. Anybody else? I mean, I, I, maybe I just wanted to kind of ask a question and have, you mentioned this whole idea of hybridity and I think we've been looking at that a little bit especially when we saw that because of the, of course, the hybrid condition between the United States and Mexico and we're at the border. Um, and that's one type of hybridity. Um, and we were trying to sort of think about hybridity and not only in cultural social terms, but how do you see it? I mean, maybe you already told us, but how do you see it in architecture? How does hybridity play a role in, in design? Well, that's interesting. So, so, it's really about flexibility, plasticity, right? And Henri Lefebvre talked about it. So how can you design spaces that have multiple uses and that can be configured in different ways? How can you leave the building less programmed so that it can be adapted? How, um, so how can, how can, for instance, um, you know, how can the hybrid also be a mix of culture? So it can be a cable car coming from Austria, but it has to land in another culture, which is the hills of, of Caracas. So you have to make a hybrid cable car with social functions, right? You know, with vertical gyms, music schools. So that, that's not the usual cable car that's being done in Europe at ski stations. So hybridity means about just combining different dissimilar things and maybe uh, adapting and giving more freedom. Right. And, and I think in your work, somehow infrastructure plays a, a role as important as architecture with a capital A, right? Is that, yeah, is that a... because, well, in fact, we see architecture as infrastructure because um, remember, people will only invest, governments will only invest if you want public clients, will only invest really in two or three things. They'll invest for sure in infrastructure, water, sewage, pedestrian, bicycle lane, you know, that, that they won't even question if you have a good idea for that. And so you've got to figure out how your architecture can be merged with those infrastructure projects. The second thing that we'll definitely invest in is green. The parks, any green infrastructure, they'll invest in, right? And that's good. So how do you make architecture with that green infrastructure, right? And then the third thing they'll invest in is some kind of cultural or social infrastructure. Right, right. So it's all infrastructure. Yes. That's, uh, and, and that is, if you've seen that all around, not only in Latin America, but you've seen that in other parts of the world. Is that correct? Is that still the same rule? Yeah, parts of the world that are very sensitive to, sensitive to social topics like Scandinavia, you see it very often. But, but you know, in America, um, most of the building industry is commercial. And there are no architects involved, hardly. Right, right. Commercial building. So there's no architecture uh, in the way that we would understand it through the books of, let's say, you know, Kenneth Frampton. Right. Modern architecture, yeah. It, it, what it is, it's just, it's just shipbuilding, right? It's just an industry for building. Mm -hmm. You must have had that discussion with Frampton in Colombia. Oh, many times, Frank and I were <laughs> eye to eye. He was highly influential. His book, Modern Architecture, showed everyone that the great pieces of architecture from Russian constructivism to, let's say, ending with Alejandro Aravena or something like that, um, all of the pieces of architecture that were significant in the history of the 20th century were, uh, were all having to do with utopia, with thinking about society, with building 
social architecture. Right. So if you're you need social, you're you're not you're not interesting anymore. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we're, we're we're out of time. Um, there's one space for one more question. Does anybody want to go before we thank Alfredo? I'll, I'll ask a question. Brock, yeah. It seems like uh, Caracas is a very segregated city between the barrios and the low income people and people of substance, as you kind of uh, referenced when you were saying that you didn't want to spend the night in a barrio because they knew that you were from outside. What kind of architecture exists or should exist to help blend the populations? Because it is one city made up of a bunch of different people. And ideally, you don't want these barrios to exist 100 years from now and kind of the status quo be maintained. How do you create architecture that's kind of transitory in nature and helps blend these populations together? You know, um, it's funny. It's a good question. And it's nuanced, obviously, because I didn't get into the complexity, but actually I would tell you 100% of Caracas is informal. Even the rich are building illegal structures on their buildings, on their apartment buildings, new floors, you know, balconies, closing them up. So the whole city somehow is reflecting informality. But um, the cable car tries to connect the formal part of the city with the informal. That's why it's such a significant project. So, and the, all the social infrastructure housing that we tried to build up on the hill was to bring all of the missing little pieces of schools, music schools, etc., gyms, up to service the areas that had none of that, right? The, um, so yes, you're right. We were trying to bridge. In fact, we had a project called the Six Municipality. So Caracas has five municipalities with five police forces, but we wanted to invent the Six Municipality, which would be all the river beds and green zones of the city. So we would link them all together and they would become the glue because all the barrios were somehow plugged in to the river beds to the ancient riverbeds coming down from the mountains. So if we declared that all public, public green zones, we would be able like an octopus to link the whole city together through the green spaces. So yes, our, all of our work is all about linking the formal and the informal. Yeah. Excellent. That's of excellent. Of course, my structures are formal. Guys, I'm trying to formalize the informal. And I, when I do architecture in the formal city, I like to informalize the formal. It's, it's the reverse, but by doing that, I'm linking the two. Right. Excellent. Well, um, first of all, well, thank you very much, Alfredo. It was an amazing talk. It's been a long time, what, 20 years or something? Yes, yes. I'm so glad I reached out to you and you were able to do that. Thank you very much to do this. But we never disconnected, actually. We were always connected. So. <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I mean, your work is always very, very relevant to us, uh, especially, you know, on our side of the world. Maybe one uh, day I can get out there to Oklahoma and see Bruce Goff's stuff. I've never seen it in person. Yeah, yeah. We better come early because uh, we don't want, you know, some of it, would start probably disappear, but uh, there's some jewels around still. So, um, uh, it's, uh, especially his disciples that also built uh, like Herb Green, and there's a beautiful yeah. house, the, ch the Prairie Chicken House, you will find amazing. Now it's um, guarded better by the university. So, hope to have send me here. a picture of the chicken house. I'll, 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 yeah, it, you'll you'll see. You'll love it. You'll love it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, where are you right now? I'm in Oslo. Okay. I and just what? opened an office in Oslo and we're doing a competition for a whole new industrial city center uh, in one of the fjords off Bergen, the second city of, of Norway. Wow. Wow. So it's really interesting because there's a drug addiction um, center there. And it's under a highway, so it has all the complexities that I'm normally used to work. Right, right. Familiar, you're familiar to those uh, challenges, right? All right. Uh, well, we, what time is it in Oslo? It's probably late, right? It's, it's late. It's nine fifteen. Yeah. Okay. 
we'll 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 let you go. I'm going to thank you again um, for for this great lecture. Uh, we we'll wait uh, for the book coming out, mm -hmm. um, and uh, also want to thank Emma for being a, such a good host. Thank uh, you, Emma. And uh, please uh, stay in touch. Uh, you have the link now. You can join us for the other lectures if you wish to, if you have time. Hopefully, we'll see you again. Um, It'd be to, nice. Uh, I'm always available if you need me. To see the other, uh, to see the other something cities. Something good to do to build. We should build something with your studio. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I'm sure uh, a lot of people are excited. And uh, uh, this, uh, we recorded uh, the, the session, so I hope you don't mind. Uh, I will share it with uh, the rest of the students sure, uh, from, from from the faculty. I mean, from the School of Architecture. Thank okay. You. Well, thank you very much, Alfredo, and uh, thank you all, thank thank you you all for being here. Hasta luego. Gracias. Gracias.